All right. Well, it is it is Monday, and I can see our faces, and I see a little yes. bar that says there's noise. So I I think we're good. I mean, I guess we'll find out. My my wife awesome. is my normal QA agent. She unfortunately is picking up my son today from soccer tryouts for his high school. So I have no idea if she's going to be paying attention or not. So so maybe they can't even hear me at all, and it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll we'll, be okay. We'll, we'll fix it in post. Uh, except I don't yeah. want to do that. But anyway. <laughs> good afternoon, Ryan. How are you this fine Monday, my friend? I am doing pretty good. Uh, yeah, I just come back from like two weeks of, of vacation, so I'm trying to get back into things. But this is a good good welcome back here. I was going to say, good this should be back. a real smooth on-ramp then back into doing work. Right? It's, yeah, uh, just trying to get my brain wrapped around everything that I've missed oh, for the past two weeks, oh, you know, so. I would just start by deleting all the email and, <laughs> you know, go from there. Yeah, yeah. Deleting all the emails and then all the GitHub notifications oh, and then all the Slack notifications that uh -huh. I missed as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I clearly need to do something about that with GitHub because my my Gmail account keeps filling up because there's enough repos that I either watch or am part of that I get enough of those that that unless I periodically go through and do a mass purge, Gmail yeah. tells me you are out of space, and I'm like, how's this possible? Like, isn't this? gigs like is, i thought gigs was a lot and it used to be right when we were younger but not anymore yeah well, i don't know i know it's amazing uh but yeah it's 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 a get gets a little crazy with the uh the github repo notifications for sure mm -hmm. um so yeah I, I have to do the same thing it's I, I, gmail uh because all my because my my github account is, is tied to my my personal email address so all my work github stuff comes to my personal email Thank account you. But it's gotten really so. In, in Gmail's gotten really smart about for some reason. It it now understands like the the repos that I'm most interested in for some reason. Somehow oh. I don't know how. Maybe it's some. We may not want to know how. I don't really want to know how, but it might be tracking the clicks or something. I don't know. Sure. Anyways, there's some magic happening that they're doing now that 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 they the, the ones that I really almost always care about come into like the updates tab as opposed to going into the forums tab sure. which is the rest where the rest of the stuff goes so right. that's working to my advantage because i actually you know can target the ones that i actually care about and respond back to instead of having to filter through all the ones in the other from the other repos but maybe i should just unsubscribe from all of them i don't really know yeah yeah that's that's <laughs> always an option the right solution yet. <laughs> I, I did have to do that with something i don't remember which repo it was it was one of those things that when it first came out we sort of got the blanket hey everybody should be tracking this and so i did mm -hmm. And that's when my Gmail account filled up the first time because I had forgotten that I had sent that like straight to archive or something. And yeah, it turns out it was a really noisy repo. And so I had to just, all right, let's just, let's just not pay attention to that. because I haven't in a year, so it probably isn't that important, but so, so Darth Vikes says that if it's important, they'll resend it. And I uh, completely agree with that sentiment. And I, I do love that handle Darth Vikes as a Vikings sort of fan Although I do realize there's no chance the Vikings will make it to the Super Bowl this year, but but that's that's a whole nother another conversation. But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I guess that's what we should both do because I have too many emails. My kid keeps bothering me. He's like, "You have too many emails," and I'm like, "Yeah, what's your point?" It's like, Does, doesn't that give you anxiety? I'm like, "No, I'm over that." Like, I, yeah. Sorry. The thing that gives me anxiety is the stuff that ends up in my inbox, like the 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 re, the you know the, the little red icon on my iPhone that says you have blah 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 unread messages, like that that drives me insane. But yeah. in the other tabs, the stuff that I don't necessarily care about, that eh, I don't really care about that stuff. Yeah, I, I finally <laughs> turned off the badge. I did that oh, on my phone, yeah. I don't know, maybe four or five months ago, because I just I got tired of seeing the number, and and it was it wasn't changing my behavior. So, yeah. you know, as as we were talking in the pre-show, I've long I you know. Anybody who who does work with me on a regular basis should be aware of the fact that if you really need to get a hold of me, email's probably not your best bet. <laughs> but it's it's a good it's a good filter to see who really wants to get a hold of you, right? It's true. It's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, is this part of the problem? Like my ADD is going off a little bit coming back from vacation because yeah. I have a lot of red badges everywhere. Because mm -hmm. like when they came up while I was on vacation, I just like oh snooze until I get back, snooze right. until I get right. back, and then at eight o'clock this morning it was like ding 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 ding. <laughs> and I was like ah, I gotta tackle that at some Dang point. It. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess in theory, just like, you know, cleaning your house or tidying up your messy office as I glance around my messy office, if we did it a little bit at a time, it'd be easier. Yeah. And I can keep up with that for about a week and then it's it's over. Oh, yeah. What are yeah. you going to do? What are you going to do? Spring cleaning. Yeah, yeah exactly. 
Well, I know we kind of jumped right in uh, because you and I've already been chatting for half an hour here, but <laughs> why don't you give us your origin story, how you got into this crazy field of software? My cat is very interested. <sighs> Han has decided to come hang out with us here. I'm just waiting for oh, him to cool. decide to jump up and, and then mash the keyboard, and then God only knows what that'll do to, to OBS and everything else. But anyway, <laughs> let, let's let's go to your origin story here, Ryan. Oh, how far back do you want to go? How far back do you want to go? You tell know, me. Like, we don't have to go back to like elementary school, but you know, like how did you how did you get into software? That's always the most interesting one to well, me. Well, I mean, it kind of it kind of stems back there, I guess. Just elementary school, maybe not elementary school, but anyways, I I guess ever since I was a kid, I was fascinated by computers. Um, I was fortunate enough that my my grandfather um, he was working in the precious metals industry at the time. He was buying and selling. Uh, precious metals for this company and obviously a lot of that happened even back when I was a kid electronically so he was exposed to computers pretty early on I guess um, you know in the 90s and he eventually came home with one and ever since he brought one home I was kind of like wow what is this machine right and obviously as a kid you're like this got games on it. Like I can play video games. Like that's amazing. You right. Know? So uh, uh, I was attracted to it for that. The reason uh, to begin with, and then um, you know I kind of got into like, well, how's this thing kind of working and the insides? And I was like, oh, you can open this thing up, and like there's all the stuff inside, and this electronics cool, like you know um, that type of thing. I, I don't know if that's like a, a male thing or not, but um, you know taking things apart it seems to be a, a, a trend at least my son is well he's four he likes to take things apart and open them up as well um anyways but uh you know i kind of got into got got into it that way and was like i just kind of i always it came like naturally to me i don't know if that's weird too mm -hmm. like you know someone couldn't figure something out on a computer i kind of could figure it out um you know when they couldn't um and I kind of got into learning about, you know, how to make them faster because computers never fast enough. Like, nope. you know, and back then you could actually upgrade a computer without much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you could add RAM and, and, and change the CPU and, and all this other crazy stuff back then. Um, Just don't bend any of the pins that that ends up bad. Yeah. And it was probably actually more cost effective to do it back then too. Yeah. Um, despite, you know, it, you know, it's, relatively cheap to buy a computer i guess you know right. for us privileged people i guess uh quite frequently um but so it's not as big of a deal like you, you can make them so it's hard to upgrade and it's not that big of a deal um but anyways i got into that and really through most of my you know uh middle school and high school there wasn't really much in the way of software engineering offered i remember in high school there was one maybe like quarter of, so, of like quote unquote computer coding right mm -hmm. i think we did something in like basic or whatever like that and i still didn't completely wrap my head around that but i do i love computers and i i like to play around them and etc and um i decided that i was gonna go to college for computer science and um i went into college not really knowing much about computer science <laughs> unfortunately so i was kind of in for a rude awakening uh -huh. when i my freshman year and i started taking some computer science classes and i was like this is really hard you know <laughs> and like this is not easy and uh -huh. like it's it takes a certain mindset to think like i always i've always had that science mathematical mindset you know i was always good at math and science and never really good at english <laughs> or writing or uh anything like that that was you know people thought for like you should everyone should have these skills but that always came hard to me but math and science was kind of easy but there's a switch in your the way you think when you try to start writing code mm -hmm. and so many of my peers had already made that you know made that mindset shift um in high school and i hadn't been exposed to that besides that like one quarter of like basic programming right? sure um so i kind of started out behind i think when i first got to to uh to college and started taking some computer science classes so my first year my, fr my freshman year is quite difficult i remember being 
I was like, do I really want to keep doing this? Like, I think I considered switching majors at some point. Sure. Uh, at the end. And um, but I stuck with it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I went, ended up going to Northeastern University. And um, we were talking a lot about <laughs> college before this call. Yeah, we'll mostly you know, how you and I are going to afford to send our kids to college. But that's a whole yeah. other can of worms a, for a different a, show different show um i think i might just bank on my kids just being smart enough they just get full rides everywhere so, right right um, you, that's, that's, introduce that's them to sports to you know yeah. could, could you be really good at a sport yeah yeah that's my plan um anyways um what's this say oh yeah so uh um one of the benefits of northeastern is they have this this co-op program it's kind of built into the curriculum so you go to school for six months and then you get an internship for six months and so you go to school for five years but you graduate with like a year and a half of actual work experience sure. on a resume you know where if you just went to four years and you graduate you have no work experience usually right um so i, I got some internships um along the way and uh, i um, got a lot of experience that way kind of real life software engineering uh type of stuff i worked for a couple of startups um in in massachusetts uh, while i was in school so a lot of fast-paced stuff and just you know got to work along with some smart people and um graduated uh and uh, ended up landing a job uh, at ibm and um kind of started my career that way um i i'd been writing java since i was in college <laughs> uh yeah that was kind of like it's been my go-to language i kind of like it i love it I, I love it actually um for since then um i did i've done played around a little bit of node of you know javascript and some website stuff but um you know java seems to be where it's at for me i, I really enjoy it um I remember I had to write some assembly. I had to write a class. We took a class in assembly in, uh -huh. in, uh, in college. And I was like, why? Yes. Why in God's yes. name? Like, why? <laughs> like, I understand that this used to be the way you had to write code, but why am I doing this right now? Like, this yeah. is just annoying. Um, it was probably the most ridiculous thing I've ever done in my entire life. I fear that we had to work some, write some kind of like sorting algorithm. I forget which one. Sure. And like, I think everyone failed that project. Right. <laughs> it was just right. like near impossible, right? Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah. So Java has been kind of my go-to language. Yeah, I, I landed a job, you know, at IBM, um, uh, right out of college, and kind of started my career that way. Yeah, it, it's funny you mention that because I, I I recall that experience too, where you know you you go through learning some of these things, you learn the easy way, so to speak, and then they make it go do it the hard way. And it's like, but I know how to do this in a higher level language. Yes, but then you'll appreciate that higher level language. Like, I already do. I'm good. Yeah. Like, can we just <laughs> just pause it? That like, I get it. Like, I'm fine. But see, I I had this weird way through computer science. I started as a chemistry major. And it was only in OCHEM where I went, I'm kind of tired of if I make a mistake at step 27, I have to start all over. And and so I, I decided kind of at that point, let's make the switch. And so I took things a little out of order. And I, I very distinctly remember taking this one, this one test. And I looked at my prof and I said, uh, Lynn, I already know how to do this. And he's like, yeah, I know, but you just pretend you don't, you know, <laughs> it's like, okay, but I mean, I know how to do this. It's like, it's fine. It's fine. But it, 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 it's interesting. You talk about that mindset shift because I, I very distinctly remember, you know, I, I did C plus plus in college that moment where it dawned on you that the line, the compiler is complaining about probably isn't the line that might be a, the issue. And mm -hmm. sometimes you got to work your way back up and, and just, that period of adjustment to get used to what is the compiler trying to tell me here? What are these cryptic things really saying? And, Oh, mm. that's right. I forgot a semicolon here. Or I missed some mm. part of the grammar, but yeah, it yeah. definitely takes some time to kind of make that transition. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, I don't know. I don't really know how to best describe it. It's like, you have to, you have to think about, you have to, th maybe it doesn't, maybe, maybe it's just really obvious, but you have to think like, how is the, how is this code going to actually execute, right? And like, you need to, be, as you're writing the code, you need to be thinking, reasoning through how this is actually going to work. And um, it takes a while to kind of wrap your head around, like, because sometimes it's not 
something logically step by step by step by step by step like you would normally think about it sometimes you have to kind of just you know think more like the computer that's going to think yeah. interpret it than you would um so it, it takes a while to like develop that skill i think um but yeah it was it was quite the struggle for my freshman year i was like i don't know if i want to do this you know like <laughs> i usually a pretty good student and this isn't going so well right. <laughs> you know oh. uh, so maybe it's not for me but i stuck with it and i'm glad i did i I, do. I uh i i really enjoy what i do so i, I don't think i'd i'd want to do much else that's awesome really. yeah no, i i think it, it it's funny what you mentioned taking stuff apart i i had that same experience growing up you sort of lucked into that i guess and you know i had an old computer that we would take apart and we'd put stuff in it and that was no big deal like there was one computer that sat on our desk that never had the cover on it because we were always doing something with it and i i didn't realize how powerful that was until i, th I think this was maybe four or five years ago i had this old desktop tower that i built for my wife a bazillion years ago and we hadn't used it in years and my my wife was like we got to get rid of this thing I said, that's fine, but I'm taking the hard drive out, you know, because I don't I don't know where because there was some local electronics recycling thing. She, you know, yeah. wants a quarter or whatever. And so she was going to dump it there. And so I I took it apart in my kitchen and my son, who I don't know, he must have been 11, something like that at the time was like, what is going on here? And it was really interesting to see him light up as I'm pointing to all the things inside of it. And I and I had to explain to him, OK, you see that laptop over there? That's way more powerful than this thing. And he's like, whoa, that's crazy. And I said, see this phone here? That's more powerful than this thing too. And and then, of course, he looks at the laptop and he's like, can we can we take that apart? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, no, no, don't take apart my laptop. Like, you know, that's that's like the panic moment, right? So so it, it, but I did eventually secure an old like, you know, power book or something. And and he and I ripped that apart. He actually still has some of the bits and pieces floating around in his room. Like he took the hard drive and the CPU and a couple other things. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah, I still I still distinctly remember building my first computer yeah. uh, from scratch, and it was like you know I I bought all the parts with my own money, and you know built the whole thing, and it's like that sense of accomplishment to like putting together something. I I think it's kind of similar to um, someone who maybe is really into automotives and like yeah. knows how to build an engine. Like I'm sure like they probably remember the first time that they built an engine from scratch, right? right? Or, where they can take apart an engine and figure out a problem, right? And it's actually pretty similar. I think the the it's obviously a lot, you know, different in many ways, but like the fact that, you know, today modern cars are much harder to fix right. yourself right. than it was, you know, 20 years ago when you could just, you know, whatever. It's like, oh, this is obviously I gotta replace this part or whatever. You know, my dad is, you know, be like, oh, we're just going to do this, blah, 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 fix it. And it works, right? And today it's like, well, there's all these computer involved yep. and like the computer is controlling this thing and that thing and the other thing. And when the fuel gets injected into the engine, you're like, you can't just fix it yourself anymore. And it's the same thing with computers. It's like, you know, you, you can't, you just can't fix this thing. Like it, <laughs> it doesn't come apart. Like all the same parts are in here. Right, right. But no way you can fix it yourself, right? right? I have to call Apple to fix it right yeah. if something goes yeah. wrong so it's well, the same thing with your car right? and there's trade-offs there though right because you know our cars are so much more reliable than they used to be mm. the trade-off is you take it in for service and the first thing they do is plug it into the computer and they charge you 150 bucks like step one <laughs> you know and then it's a lot more expensive to fix them in many cases because things are buried or it's more of a self-sealed system and so i think about yeah. even like the laptop that i'm talking to you on here today the phone sitting in front of me the phone sitting in front of you these are marvels compared to what we had. You know, I mean, you you and I are old enough to remember like flip phones. Mm, <laughs> and yeah. It's like there's a lot of difference there, and, and a lot of it's positive. But part of that trade off is it's a self sealed system. In order right. to well, we can just pour the battery in here, and it can go into every nook and cranny. Essentially, it, it changes how you design it, and you know, it's it's all as in software architecture design. It's all trade offs and yeah. pluses and minuses. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, I do think it'd be a cool exercise to uh, with with my kids. They're they're so young, but um, you know, when they get older, to to go through and like build a computer with them, right? Because yeah. you still can do that. Yeah. Right? Oh, totally. Um, what we do with that computer, I don't really know. But <laughs> anyways, we could, we could make up some kind of excuse. But um, yeah, just to teach them, be like, hey, all that stuff that we just did is mm -hmm. like packaged in this mm -hmm. thing here, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what they know, right? They know right. this in the iPad, right? 
Um, but yeah, they don't, they don't really realize what's going on inside of it. So it's cool to see the internals for sure. Yeah, no, it was, it was really eye opening for my son to help explain to him map how that is. It's, it's in your phone. It's the same stuff. Yeah. It's just smaller and, and yep. obviously built in a different way. But thinking about building a computer reminds me of half the fun of that was picking the parts. It was oh, picking yeah. out, oh, what, ooh, we could do this. And, oh, what yeah. if we put, you know, and you're like, well, I'm going to get this graphics card. You know, I mean, that that was that was like a good two, three month project right there was just going sure. through, you know, new egg, et cetera, and picking out all the bits and pieces and then, you know, getting it all in. And then that Christmas morning feeling of, well, let's put this thing together. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was good yeah. times. That was good times. Was, but Although I'd, I'd still at this point, I'd rather just go click, click, click. And two days later, a completely functioning box shows up at my door and. <laughs> I'm okay with that. It doesn't, that doesn't yeah. bother me too much. But... Yeah. yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. So, so how did you get involved with Spring? I'm, I'm always intrigued mm -hmm. by folks that get into an open source project, especially one as, as big as Spring. Like what, do you, do you remember like what your first experience was there? How'd you go from poking around to, hey, I'd like to write some code on this. Yeah, I can tell you exactly. Uh, when that was. So um, originally when I, well, when I first got hired at IBM, I was working for uh, the team that was working on Notes Domino. I don't yeah. know if you really remember I that do. really old school stuff. Um, and at the time they had uh, IBM or yeah, I guess I think it was when IBM had acquired them. Uh, Lotus was the name of the company previously, right? Um, they rewrote the Notes client to be Eclipse-based, based on top of the Eclipse platform, because like IBM was super into Eclipse, everything had to be based on Eclipse, blah, 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 right? Uh, so they had this like <laughs> Frankenstein situation where they could never con fully convert the entire client from... C and C++ over to Java and Eclipse and OSGI. And so there was actually always this process, this C, uh, the C++ process that was running that was like the core original code. And there was all the stuff that was buckled on top of it. And it was talking back and forth between the C client and the Java client and it was, anyways. Lots of stuff going on, right? I was obviously more focused on the Java stuff, but um, lots of stuff going on. And I worked on that for probably four or five years. And over the course of that, I was working. I was working on um, kind of the piece of the cool part of Eclipse is that it's, it's extensible, right? So you yeah. could have. We had business partners that would write, you know, plugins on top of our client that they could use to to build integrations with whatever they were selling or, you know, whatever, do useful things, right? So I was working on creating APIs for our business partners to actually do this stuff, right, and interact with the, the client. Um, so I was doing a lot of, um, you know, going to conferences and talking to developers and doing presentations on how to do this stuff and doing really technical stuff like that. And I became very interested in kind of the, the developer advocacy part of this right and I, like i liked showing creating apis and then showing people how to do these things and do it in presentations and blog posts and youtube videos and all this other stuff right um except we weren't putting a lot of in ibm wasn't putting a lot of effort into that part of the notes domino business so there wasn't really much to do there right it wasn't a lot to go on but um i eventually was started to look around within ibm to, to see if there was other places where that was happening and eventually came across um, a position in the emerging technologies division in IBM. And they were just starting to work on um, this cool new thing called Cloud Foundry. And I was like, oh, this sounds really interesting. Cloud-based developer advocacy stuff. Like it was a specific developer advocacy thing. We're gonna be going to conferences, speaking to developers, you know, doing lots of cool prototyping and all this other stuff. And I was like, oh, all right, this sounds really cool. I eventually ended up landing a job in that team. And my manager at the time, 
um, was like, I don't really care what technology you use. You can use whatever, right? Node, Python, Java. I don't really care, right? As long as it shows off the capabilities of Cloud Foundry and at the time, the, the product that product name that we were working with is called Bluemix, which is IBM's branded version of Cloud Foundry. Um, you know, go for it, right? Because we're going to be at, this is a cloud platform. We want to talk to all kinds of developers, right? So me being the Java guy, I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to, you know, stick with Java. I played around with Node a little bit, played around with Python, but I always just came back to Java. And, you know, um, IBM was, you know, a lot of what they do is, is very obviously enterprise focused, right? It's very heavyweight and stuff like that. So building a web app to run on top of Cloud Foundry was like just monumental task, right? And I was started to like Google around and like see, is there any easier way, like quicker ways in Java to build like web apps, right? I don't want to use Liberty per se. I don't, you know, it's still, even Liberty was just too much sure. for me, right? And um, so I was Googling around and my my manager, he, did, he didn't care. Like it, it could be, it didn't have to be IBM Liberty. It didn't have to be an IBM technology. Like we use whatever we want. So I was like, all right. So I Googling around, Googling around. And I eventually, I think, landed across on a YouTube video of Josh Long talking about Spring Boot. And he was just like, you know, in typical Josh Long fashion, like, Bing, bang, bing, 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 blah, 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 blah. bam, got something working. Like five <laughs> minutes later, you're like, holy crap, you know, like yeah. how did that work? That seems super easy, right? And of course, he makes it look super easy on stage. He's a super smart guy and great presenter, right? And a lot of practice. Um, People don't, don't appreciate how much practice it goes into making that look so darn easy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, I was like, oh, this, this spring boot thing looks super cool, right? Um, let me, let me play around with that. And I started playing around Spring Boot and I was like, wow, that's, that's really nice. Like, you know, you know, I compile this thing and run my Maven build and all of a sudden I have this jar and I don't have to do anything. I just start the jar and the jar starts a web app, you know, web container and the web app starts up and holy crap, this took me, you know, this is far less complicated than anything else I've ever seen. Um, so that kind of led me down the spring path. And then I, because I was kind of focused more on the Cloud Foundry side, shortly after I discovered Spring Boot, I came across this other project that had just gotten started called Spring Cloud. Mm -hmm. And back then it was just one project called Spring Cloud. It was not a, that was not the, you know, the, the, uh, I don't know, umbrella <laughs> the top level, right. the umbrella project, right? right. It was the, there was the one GitHub repo called, re, re, repo called Spring Cloud. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. It has some, you know, integration with, with doing things with Cloud Foundry and started playing around with that. And then, um, you know, so I was keeping an eye on it and I was playing around with it. And then um, a few months later, I, you know, went back and checked out the Spring Cloud project and I was like, oh, this changed, right? It's not just one project anymore. There's now like four or five. It was config server and Verica and Netflix and, and um, you know, all these other couple other projects. And I was like, oh, well, let me check out what this new stuff is. And I started playing around with like service discovery and, and uh, circuit breakers and Hystrix and Ribbon and, you know, all the kind of original stuff that, um, uh, Dave Sire and Spencer Gibb kind of did. And uh, I started playing around with it. And of course, as I started to use it and, and mess around with it and use it as for my demos that I was doing on top of Bluemix and Cloud Foundry at IBM, I can't, eventually came across bugs and I would create issues and, and you know, I'd see Spencer or Dave respond to me. And eventually I just like, or, well, I know how to fix this at this point. So like I started submitting PRs and, and whatnot. And uh, Dave and Spencer were going around to various conferences and I eventually kind of met them in person and started talking to them. I was like, hey, you know, I'm trying to do this or I want to do this and I don't know how to do this. And I remember sitting down with Dave's Iyer one conference specifically and be like, Dave, I'm trying to do this. And I don't know what is going on here. Like, what's wrong? Like, what am I doing wrong here? And he's like, oh, we haven't, we never thought about doing that. You know, you should submit a you know, PR for that or whatever. 
So I would just start making contributions because I was trying to do things that they hadn't thought of doing. And eventually, um, after a while of creating issues and submitting PRs, Dave uh, reached out to me. He's like, hey, are you interested in a job? <laughs> and I was like, oh, it actually ended up being kind of perfect timing because sure. um, I had, um, at this point, my I was traveling a lot going literally around the world, talking, doing speaking at, at conferences and stuff like that for my uh, developer advocacy role. And, but uh, my daughter had recently been born. And so um, my personal life, it was not as conducive to traveling uh, all the time anymore because I had a small child at home. Um, and uh, so that kind of between you know my wife and I had kind of decided that needed to change and so you know Dave had asked me about this position it was more developer position than developer advocacy so I wouldn't be traveling as much anymore and um yeah kind of the rest is history I kind of did some interviews and got hired on a pivotal and kind of began down my my journey of working on spring and spring cloud um which is super fortunate and super grateful because like the, the people that I've gotten to work with since I've been. Because uh, I've asked a lot of newbie kind of questions and, you know, I've never had the feeling that anybody is, is judging me based on that. And people are just willing to dive in and help you out. And, you know, I think that's one of the real strengths of, of Spring, in my opinion, is just how strong that community is around it. And, uh, you know, I think that's something that, you know, isn't, isn't maybe fully appreciated, you know, but, and my cat has decided to join us. So he's, he's <laughs> shedding all over me now. And I, I, and on cue, uh, Twitch decided to just reboot itself. So, so this will probably get divided into two videos that I'll have to splice back together poorly. Um, oh, and now there's other humans home. So, so the cat is, is going to go amuse himself <laughs> with somebody else. But anyway, so is there, do you have any advice for somebody that's like, I too would like to get involved with an open source project, whether spring or something else. Like what, what would your mm. advice be to someone who says, I really want to try to contribute to my favorite open source project? Yeah. Um, I think the, the one thing that I can suggest all the open source projects that I I've, I've ever contributed to is basically like, there's always some, something that needs to get done right that no one is doing um and it could be as simple as just writing some documentation or working on like updating the the web page for the open source project or something like there's there's these tasks that people don't do because you know there's critical bugs to be worked on blah blah, blah. and when you're just getting started like find the silliest, easiest thing that you possibly can do, right? I love it when people make documentation changes. Yeah. Like, thank God. Like, you know, uh, it, it seems so like to when you're getting started, you're like, oh, no one's going to really care about this. But like, it's super appreciated because we just don't have the time to like keep documentation up to date as, as well as we'd like to, or like make something, or maybe it just doesn't sound doesn't flow the way you think it does because we're so close to the project that right. it just makes sense to us. Whereas someone who's new is coming in, they're coming in with a completely, you know, unbiased perspective of it and it might not make sense to them. So, you know, if you can suggest changes and make changes that makes it better for other people to come in and do the project, like, so simple stuff like just documentation changes or, you know, working on the website or for the project or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. In the Spring community, we have like a specific tag on GitHub issues called for first time contribution or something like that, um, which are just like, they're probably, they're just really easy, uh, either enhancements or bug fixes or whatever um, that, that someone that's new to the project can work on. Uh, another place that often gets neglected is testing. Yeah. If you can go and find a piece of code or some tests or add some more tests to a project, like super appreciative of that. Again, it might seem like you're not adding any real value 
to the end project, but you are like you're, you're doing stuff, things around the build or, you know, that type of stuff um, are always good things that are always super appreciated that people kind of just like, uh, it's not really important, but what, so why would I do that? Um, and then from there, I think it's about like I did is just, you know, you have use cases that the, the maintainers of the project probably aren't thinking of. And if you can, you know, add functionality that addresses those use cases in some way or another, it could be very small. It doesn't have to be incredibly big pieces of code. I'd rather see small changes than gigantic PRs of like 40 or 50 files, you know, just little stuff here and there and just start small. And it helps you get the understanding of, of, of things. I've had lots of people in, in the spring projects, they just make like kind of like best practice changes to the code sometimes like that's how they get their feet wet their feet sure. wet into the project and they start making like just best practice changes that we just didn't, you know didn't do or whatever weren't smart enough to do or whatever um and those are all like huge contributions that um you know just get your feet wet and are are super impactful to a project um so yeah those are some suggestions yeah that's that's great stuff and i'll plus one on the documentation piece i remember landing in london and working on this demo sort of jet lagged you know early in the morning and ran into this this issue and i couldn't figure out what was going on the error message didn't make any sense so i dumped it in the slack channel and and ironically i think it was dave that chimed in along with a couple other people and and i had copied well the the direction said like copy the username or something and what they really meant was the user id and mm. and it took a little bit of oh well isn't that the same it's like well not always it's not the same for me so you know maybe update the documentation and it was an interesting back and forth to see the yeah but but your documentation said this so fix the documentation yeah. and then i think like yeah. a few minutes later the documentation was updated i'm like chaos engineering the docs well, you know <laughs> I, can, I can deliver some value but Yep. Yeah, I think I think those are great points because when you are that close to it, you don't you don't realize that there's a gap here, and that's where having that fresh perspective. And I, I think it's intimidating, especially in a big project, to to do that. But but that fresh set of eyes to me is so powerful that you're going to see something that people have worked on it for five years are going to miss. So don't be afraid to you know to lend a hand there. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Like I I just think that we're we're so the people that work on the project every day are just so you know, ingrained in, the, in that that way of thinking and are familiar with it, that they don't see the gaps um, all the time. So they don't see the problem. They don't see the, right. the whatever. The, there might be a huge gap, even not even just the way the documentation flows, it's just functionality wise, like there might be a huge gap uh, and room for improvement that um, I think that a fresh set of eyes provides. So we're always happy to have first time contributors and new contributors to a project. Um, Particularly, you know, you know, you've you, a lot of times it's it's you you shouldn't be shy either because people have run into a problem and they're really bright engineers, so they've probably debugged the code and they know exactly where the problem is of what the fix is, and you know they probably know you know how to make the fix, and they're just a little shy about right. actually contributing, making the code change and. Um, you know, I encourage you to just, you know, open the issue and submit the PR alongside of it, because I cannot be happier for someone, if someone reports a bug and then also says, here's how to fix it. And here's the fix for it. Cause that just makes our lives so much easier. <laughs> um, instead of like me having to go back and like, okay, I have to reproduce this and I have to right. go redo all the work that you've already done as right. a, a super smart engineer to come to the same conclusion. You already know what it is. Um, so don't be shy. Uh, you, you know, I know you probably, the engineers out there probably know uh, what the fix is and how to make the fix and how to fix the problem. So don't be shy about submitting the PR as well as the issue. <laughs> nice. Well, let, let's, let's switch directions a little bit because I, I know you live in the beloved New England area and as mm. fall is rolling around, how annoying are all the people who apparently have no trees where they live and go invade your part of the world? constantly to stare at trees do, do you just leave the state for the month of october i mean how do you handle that no i mean i i do i i grew up in new england i am originally from rhode island 
um, I mentioned that I went to to college in, in Boston, then uh, that's where I met my wife and she's from New Hampshire. So that's where we currently live here in New Hampshire. And it is 100% true that September and October, the reason why there's traffic on the highways on the weekends is because everyone from the South is driving up North to go uh, look at the leaves. And I can't blame them. I still, I still every fall, um, you know, walk out my door and say, damn, it looks really nice outside right now. Um, and I'm privileged enough to, to, to just, be able to walk out my door and do that. And I can right. understand why people probably come here uh, to do that. I just generally, um, it's kind of like you live in New England, you know that on the weekends, pretty much from the end of September to the middle of October, don't try to go north on the highway sure. because it's just going to be traffic. Sure. <laughs> uh, also, don't try uh, and book any kind of like uh, getaway uh, at that period of time in your own state because right. the right. prices are just astronomically high because they know everyone wants to come. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, like I said, I don't have to go very far. I don't leave the state. I just just kind of walk out my door and um, I, I spend, I do enjoy spending a lot of time out outside uh, regardless of the time of year, all four seasons, uh, but particularly going for uh hikes and trail runs in the fall is, is really beautiful. And, um, yeah, I would, I, I always tell my wife, like we talk about, you know, when the kids are gone, what we're going to, where we're going to live after that. And I'm like, I don't really want to live anywhere else. I'd rather, I, I kind of like to live here in new England, even though it's quite cold in the, in the winter, but, um, yeah, the, the leaf peeping thing is, is a real thing. It's a real, it's a real thing here. <laughs> okay. It's, it's not just a media hype thing. All right, all right. No, it actually is like everyone invades the, the, the Northeast, particularly in Vermont and New Hampshire sure. and Maine for, for about three to four weeks there in the fall. Yeah. I guess the part that surprises me is I've been to Boston many times. They have trees. Yeah, it, it isn't like you 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 are staring at like well, I've never seen a tree before. This is amazing. It changes color. No way. So I, I guess that's the part that's a little bit of a head scratcher for me is as to why people are so you know what is it about again that sort of Maine Vermont you know New Hampshire. Area so I think it is. I th what I think it is is like if you're in a more populated part of New England, the the there's the density of trees is not enough, right? Sure. You might have one tree over sure. there that changes and looks really nice, but when you can get over, when you can get up uh, at a, at a view at a, an elevation where you can see a forest of trees, sure. Uh, like on the side of a mountain or something like that. That's fair. Then that's really impressive. And that's what I think people come, sure. come for is to, to get into the mountain because most of the people are going up into the mountains, right? They're, okay. they're not coming. They're not coming mm -hmm. to like, you know the the you know they're not coming to Boston. They're not coming to, to to Providence. They're not coming to Manchester here in New Hampshire. They're going up to the the Green Mountains and the White Mountains. Sure, most people, anyways. And um, yeah, they're they're looking up in the mountains and and seeing the whole the whole forest. Which I was I was up in the White Mountains. This or I mentioned I was on vacation, um, and we were driving through the back roads in the mountains and even without the the leaves changing color it's just it's beautiful mm -hmm. up there you know to to see the mountains and stuff like that so um uh and i live in the state so you know uh i see it quite frequently so but yeah i can i can understand the, the drive for people who are living in more you know uh densely populated areas with sure fewer sure. trees to, to to even make the trip up here yeah. sure so what when, when you're not driving through or dealing with the the leaf uh viewing population what what do you do for fun what kind of hobbies do you have what what you, you love being outside even in winter which we'll have to talk about because uh, i don't know about you but the older i get the less i like winter um yeah so outside of 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 work and uh spring and and writing software and stuff like that i um my other passion is really around health and fitness I, um, which might explain why I like spending a lot of time outside. Um, 
I like uh, obstacle course racing. So those of you not familiar with that is basically imagine trail running with a bunch of obstacles along the way, climbing ropes, going over walls, going through water, picking up heavier objects and carrying them an ungodly distance. Um, so I do a lot of um, uh, training for that. So um, you know, a fair amount of running and strength training and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if that's a hobby, but I that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> outside of, uh, of coach, I should say I'm a, a, fa a father first. So I have two kids that first outside of working kids then training and fitness after that, after that, um, I'm fairly, but, I'm fairly certain our spouses would not say that, that, that raising our children as a hobby, uh, but yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. They, they, a, they take a up a lot of time that comes yes. up uh, yes. before anything else. Uh, yeah. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, really into to doing that type of stuff. So I, I love being outside. I like, I like, um, I like going, like, I, like I mentioned, uh, my favorite time of the year to run on the trails is in the fall. Sure. Uh, just because you're, you know, you get to see all that, that beauty of nature, um, up close and personal. Um, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really into that. Um, uh, if you really like to see see uh what i'm all about and that that part of my life my instagram is probably the place to go or generally have my my workouts and stuff posted there as well as my love for food high quality food <laughs> stuff like that so yeah are you are you on strava i should ask you that i i am on strava okay. yes i am on strava although i'm not like i'm not as obsessed about strava as some people are yeah. I, I know people are like you know, they, Strava they have or to, it didn't happen. Yeah, Strava or it didn't happen, or in like they have to get, you know, improve on certain segments to their run or like be the top person for that segment and stuff like that. And I really don't pay attention to that stuff, sure. honestly. Um, it doesn't I I don't even pay for Strava. I still use the free okay. version. <laughs> um I uh I just kind of compare myself to myself, basically. Sure. I, I don't really care what anyone else does because it doesn't matter to me, but it gets people, if it gets people excited and gets people, gets people active and it motivates them to go out and, and do something, you know, um, great, but that's, that's not the motivation for me. So, uh, sure. yeah. Well, those, but those leaderboards uh, can be brutal to look at, you know, I mean, I will yeah. never be a particularly fast cyclist. I just don't have the physique for that. You know, <laughs> I, my, my wife and I did this ride in july kind of around where we went to school and coming down one of these hills i think we were doing 33 miles an hour or something like that and i remember thinking to myself that's more or less what the, the peloton is riding in the tour de france like just just mm. pedaling along and mm. i thought wow you know that then and i go uphill really slowly i go downhill much much more quickly but I also realized that I'm about twice the size of most of those guys, roughly, you know, I mean, they yeah. weigh about 137 pounds. I'm not that yeah. never will be. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, you look at how fast some of these people can go on a segment and I'm just like, yep, never yeah. going to even sniff the top hundred on that. Like without maybe yeah. even e-bike, you know, but <laughs> anyway. yeah, people get, I know, I know there's, there's quite a few people that I know of that like, as soon as something like I, you know, because it automatically uploads to Strava. Like as soon as it right. gets automatically uploaded from my watch or whatever the Strava, like bam, like bam, like every time. I'm like, do you live on Strava? Like I, it's like people. I, I think some people use Strava like they use Facebook, like or Instagram. Like they're totally. always there, checking it all the time. Um, they get really into it, but I, yeah, I, I, I still, it doesn't get me that excited to see other people's stuff. Like sure. it, you know, uh. I like to see what other people do, but I just don't compare myself to them basically is, is you know, and that's what I, I think, feel like you can get in trouble and get yourself depressed if you're like, like you said, like, oh, I'll never be that fast or, right. you know, um, you know, maybe you're trying to do things for the wrong reason. Like you're, you're constantly trying to, you know, push this pace because you want to be the top of this leaderboard, which right. means really nothing at all. And you end up hurting yourself and, so anything, you know, anything like that just kind of doesn't get me going. So I try to just not get too caught up in all that stuff. <laughs> Smart. Well, there have yeah. been instances of people doing dangerous things to try to take over, you know, a king or queen of the mountain. And 
some segments have actually been removed because they're too dangerous for people. And so they don't even want folks trying it. You know, certainly some dissents I know have been, been taken out because of that, you know, and there's at least a few instances where people have either been severely injured or died because they were doing risky things in an effort to shave off a few seconds. Yeah. I, I seem to remember some people talking about like people getting in like a car or something like that and then doing a segment like, you know, like, uh, to try and to, to spoof the system. Um, I don't know how Strava's algorithms work, whether they can figure that out pretty easily or not, but um, I don't know. But yeah, I, I, I know there's some funky stuff going on. Yeah, it's, but, yeah. it's funny you mentioned that. I, my, my wife and I had done a ride earlier this summer and there was one segment that I figured she had a pretty good shot of, of taking the Queen of the Mountain at and I was looking at it afterwards and somebody the person who had it, I looked at their ride and like their average mile per hour was like 12. Mm -hmm. And then for that one segment, they were doing like 19 or 20 or some crazy thing. And I'm like, yeah, were you, were you deliberately hunting this segment? And so you're just sort of like slow pedaling everything else. And then you just nuked that one. Right, you know, I don't remember right. how big the segment was, but it just seemed odd to me and, and and i don't i don't know strava well enough to know do they investigate something like that if i press a button do they investigate something like that? but i mean it just just smelled wrong right yeah yeah i don't know but i i, I have heard that people are like trying to hack the system oh of course you know, one yeah. way or another uh, yeah. which is inevitable people always always try and do that so yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the joy of software and and anything social that humans are involved with <laughs> even or something as silly as I'm the king of the mountain on the segment up, you know, by my house. Sure, it like, means absolutely nothing. Cool. C could, yeah. Can you monetize that? So oh, you yeah. can't. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I guess Phil Gaiman did. He he's a former pro cyclist who, after he retired, decided, you know, he's got all this fitness from being a pro cyclist. What can he do? And he started hunting KOMs, but taking trying to take KOMs away from people that they knew to be doping. You know, people mm. who had been caught doping at masters races or, you know, amateur races. And so he's like, I'm hunting anything that guy's got. And I think you've got most of them, you know, and he's oh, wow. turned that into now a whole video thing and he's sponsored and all that stuff. So mm. he's basically still a pro cyclist. So <laughs> I don't know, a lot of ways to make money these days, Ryan, I guess is the moral of the story. But I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Although I have to, I have to say the whole idea of these, these obstacle course races just is so odd to me because Running a 5K or a 10K seems like it should be enough. And it, it reminds mm -hmm. me of like the steeplechase where where somebody after running like a 5,000 went, well, you know, that was fun. But, yeah. you know, what would make it more interesting is if we put some really big hurdles in the way, not the kind that fall over if you hit them, but the kind that will like take your leg off if you don't quite get it right. And then, hey, let's put a yeah. pool out there too that you got to jump into and run around. I mean, it clearly comes yeah. from that same sort of mentality of this is hard, yeah. but we could make it harder. Yeah. I think there's a um, there's a really good documentary uh, documentary 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 there we documentary. go on um, plan plan, uh, yeah. plan, plan, yeah. plan I told you I was not good at English it was, it's, fine. Was not, it's fine it's fine we'll fix it in my post forte. yeah um, anyways there's a, a a really really good documentary on uh, obstacle course racing uh, called the Sufferfest mm -hmm. um, which the name implies what a lot of obstacle courses are um it kind of goes into the whole why behind obstacle course racing why do people get attracted to it and for me the attraction was the fact that it was not just running like sure. yeah running is hard R running a five minute mile for 26 miles or whatever ungodly you know speed these people are coming close to at the two-hour marathon mark you know, it's not easy. That is, that is, they make it look easy, but that's right. not easy at all. Um, and so why do anything different? Right. And for me, it's like, I think it's, it more, um, it more relates to has how we would have evolved as humans. Sure. Um, you know, running 26 miles in a straight line, for the most part it's not really natural right <laughs> uh we probably did more things like yeah we did some running we did some hiking 
up hills. We probably carried some heavy things. We probably dove into the water a few times, you know, through a spear, through a spear, through a spear. Um, um, so it's more functional. I think I don't really like the word functional, but you can think of it like that. It's more sure. functional as, uh, as a human. I think it, it, it's more functional. Um, I, I think it also breaks up the monotony of just pounding the pavement for me to um like i said i enjoy being outside in the trails and on the mountains and um it's better than running on a road um and i think there's something to doing something challenging both mentally and physically um you know in that way that uh, is ingrained in us it's very primal it's you know Think we're our bodies expect to do something like that right um and so for me i think it's more about um exploring kind of the limits of your body um in all aspects from running to swimming to, to lifting to from the mental aspect of it to, to everything um and i think obstacle course racing is unique in that it does all that stuff simultaneously in one sure. event um so yeah i, I that for me, I think that's that's the reason why I, I enjoy it. Um, there's that sense of accomplishment that you get at the end of any physical event, but um, I think for me, it's more of the sense of accomplishment that I'm kind of like a more complete human being mm -hmm. uh, by by challenging my body in all those different ways at the end of a race. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that does that answer your question. <laughs> yeah, well, I I think I've I watched that documentary on a plane, if I remember right, and okay, th there was or there was one similar to it where this this person has run this race for years, and it's like every year he comes up with some twist that just makes it the hardest race on the planet, yes. and yeah. And it's some crazy things, things that are like, is this, is this legal? Are you, you know, <laughs> really sure? And, and I remember seeing like they're watching the post race where several of these people were basically hypothermic and they're by the fire and they're shivering uncontrollably. And like, yeah, that sounds like a fun way to spend your weekend. But, uh, you know, hey, to each their own. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying that everyone should uh, needs to do it at all um I, I it's not for everyone my my wife and i both ran uh our very first obstacle course race together and i finished it and said i can't wait to do this again and she said i'm never going to do this again and she hasn't done it again <laughs> she's stuck to that she's Only stuck five? to that so it's not for her she's she likes to do triathlons and you sure. know that type of stuff is fine but she's not obstacle course racing is not not for her and um I think I, I have a firm believer. I don't really care what you do. Like just find something that's hard to do yeah. and you like to do it and do it and challenge yourself. And that could be physical. It could be mental. It could be whatever you, you want it to be. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, just choose, pick your poison. I think everyone right. has their poison, right? I'm sure everyone can say, Oh, I do this. And I'll be like, I'm not doing that. Like that's, that's crazy. Like ask me to sit down and I don't know, do draw something right like right to me that's like the hardest thing in the world i can't draw right uh, so or play an instrument or whatever yeah. right um you know uh th that type of thing so yeah well it's good we all have different hobbies because otherwise it'd be really crowded you know? yeah so so i think that's part of it right is you find the thing you enjoy and and you roll with it and nothing wrong with that yeah right? I like riding my bike. I like playing golf, you know, and there's plenty of people who both of those are like, you gotta be kidding me, right? I can't imagine anything more boring. And it's like, well, yeah, cool. You know, because it's to each their own. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I golf, golf is a great sport. I've, I've played it many times, but it is super challenging. Yeah. It's a super challenging thing to do. Like it takes a lot of patience and a lot of coordination and um, practice for sure. <laughs> it's just like the most important thing I think in golf. Um, yeah, that's uh, just find your thing that 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 does it for you, and and as long as there's something there, right. I think it's important. Right. Yeah. So as we come out of hopefully this whole pandemic thing, is is there any place you're dying to get back to? You know, I, I I'm in the role you used to be, and we used to spend a lot of time on airplanes, and mm -hmm. this is the longest stretch I've gone without being on an airplane. It feels very strange, but is there <laughs> any place you're just boy, I can't wait to go to this event or go to this place or visit this mm. city so we did get on an airplane 
a few months ago, we went down to uh, Florida for a little vacation. Um, it was the first taste of travel and it was, it was good. Um, <laughs> uh, Florida is not my all, all, all too destination. Like I, I'm not a huge fan of being there. There's many places I'd rather go back to, but um, I think the place that I, and this is pre pandemic, even that I still want to go back to. Um, I spent some time in Alaska. Oh yeah. Um, before my daughter was born with my wife and, um, I have yet to go back. So it was about eight years ago, um, that I was there. Um, but it was probably the best trip I've ever been on. I, you know, like I said, I've traveled to many places throughout the world. Um, for work and stuff like that and i have yet to be to a place like alaska um so you know the, the barrier before covid was my kids are still too young right uh that i i would take them my wife says we gotta wait a few more <laughs> years um my daughter is she's seven she's probably at an age now where uh, you know she would we could bring her there and she would remember seeing right. the things that she would see uh, my son is still, he's four. So he has a little bit, a few more years, probably realistically. Um, the other, the other barrier to that is like sticking kids on a plane is always just like a challenge in general. Yes. Um, and it's, uh, there's not like you can get a direct flight to Alaska. So right. um, it's a right. multi, multi plane trip. Um, and then, the, you know, there's a lot of driving uh, in a car uh, mm -hmm. in Alaska, which is great because the scenery just like here is, amazing even more so in alaska but that's the place that i want to i want okay. to get back to um uh hopefully within a few years once my son's old enough um uh my second choice on that list i know you didn't ask me for another one but the second choice um i really loved amsterdam yes i i like amsterdam um i, I don't know what it is about about amsterdam but it's like that it has that quintessential European mm -hmm. feel to it for a reason. Yeah. Um, it's I'd, a cool I'd be, yeah, I've been there a few times and I'd really like to get back. Uh, if I had to pick a place and then another part of the world outside of the United States, um, that'd probably be the, the other place I'd probably really want to get back to. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've flown through Schiphol or Schiphol more times than I care to admit being mm -hmm. a, a Delta person. That's their European primary yeah. european hub so i've gone through there a lot yeah yeah it's just the the feel the vibe the mm -hmm. you know the, everything about it the food is just it's a really nice place to be uh, I, I was there in the fall actually uh, i think about because i remember seeing the trees change uh there um and just you know staring down the the canals with the the, the fall colors on the trees it's just a really beautiful time uh, to be there so yeah, I really like their bike infrastructure, especially when I compare that to what we have around here. Uh, and it just uh, it doesn't doesn't even compare. No, I mean, <laughs> no, it's absolutely it is it is as epic as everyone says it is. Oh yeah, like, I mean, yeah, it's just bikes everywhere. It's just and everywhere. and they have the right of way basically everywhere. Yeah, you know, Christine yeah. and I did a ride last month on this this trail in central Minnesota, and and it's beautiful. It's an awesome trail, and there's all these spots where you're like yield, and I'm like yield to what there there's there's it's it's farmer bob's field i you know he comes through here like four times a year that you know and i'm sure they had to put those signs there to to placate farmer bob because no way i'm yielding to no cyclist but i, I see it a lot when we ride around here despite signs everywhere motorists have no concept that the trail's there and they don't look yeah. they don't they they block the trail and it's it's really frustrating you know and it, it just I wish the rules were written so that no, you have to stop for the trail because it's a lot easier to stop your car than it is yeah. for me to stop on a on my bike when I'm clipped in and I'm I've got some momentum and now I got to come to a complete stop because you know you can't pay attention so always always fun <laughs> and I'd see who's yeah. the more vulnerable user of this facility that's right that's me that's true that's true yeah, yeah. good that's times true. good times yeah uh, yeah well let me throw a few lightning round questions at you and see what kind of trouble that gets us into. What uh, what's your kind of go-to comfort meal? You know, what do you what what's 
what makes you think of home or what do you what do you really get excited about on the on the dinner rotation does it have to be dinner no gosh no okay um banana bread french toast oh yeah. oh now i'm intrigued yeah so okay. it's french toast but made with banana bread uh, and uh i'm here for it so yeah so it's it's it has a nostalgic feel to me because uh -huh. i grew up my grandmother would make uh epic uh banana bread and uh yeah just banana bread itself is epic but then yes. you make it in french toast and throw some maple syrup on it okay delicious now now right. where do you come down on chocolate chips in your banana bread yeah i'm not a huge fan of chocolate so i oh. i'd rather not have okay chocolate chips in my banana bread i mean okay. i could maybe walnuts like walnuts Ooh. can i can okay. do that okay all right but i'd eat it but sure. i I'd, I'd almost prefer without the chocolate okay. chips okay all right. Yeah. all right that's fair that's fair now I, I know you were sipping on something earlier but coffee espresso or tea mm. cappuccino all right is where that's it's at go to okay yeah okay. yeah if i can find a good cappuccino that's where um that's where it, and you know i'm sure someone's gonna say there's much better cappuccinos out there but honestly i have yet to taste a cappuccino that's better than blue bottles cappuccino uh, i don't I'm know a why big fan of blue bottle yeah i don't really know why i know they're kind of more of like a chain you know and there's probably some coffee house out there that's like you know makes the best cappuccino in the world i have yet to come across it but if I am near a blue bottle, I will get a cappuccino every time. Yeah, the, the last time I was in New York, so like right before everything got shut down, I did not realize until my second or third day that I was passing a blue bottle as I was going from my hotel to the venue. And I was so mad at myself because my the beans I typically make my espresso from every morning are blue bottle. Mm. And okay. so I was very mad at myself for not, and, and in my defense, it was hidden and there was a lot of construction. <laughs> and so I didn't see it. If I would have seen the logo, I'd have been like, I'm here for my third shot of the day. Thank you. But yeah. So, yeah. well, next time we're on the road, you'll have to come hang out with us because you know, my team will find the best coffee in a given city. We are really, really good at that. So yes, we, I we'll do. take care of you. You know, that's, that's our, sure. part of our job, but <laughs> how about pie or cake? I mean, if you're going to do an obstacle run, that you you've earned some calories. Yeah. Um, cake. Okay. Yeah. Now this is one I'm always intrigued by, since I, you know you're close to both oceans or mountains. Ooh. It's tough for me because I grew up, like I said, uh, in Rhode Island, you know, around the ocean a lot, and. Uh, but I have to say mountains. Okay. I, you know what, you know what it is about the ocean that I, that really gets me? It's the sand. Mm. You get sand on you and it, it's just never going away. Nope. It's, it's there until you get in the shower yep. and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mountains. Mountains. Okay. I, I, I love being in the mountains. And three weeks later, you're finding sand in something. You're like, how'd that happen? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. You. And when you have kids, it's just it, it's worse. Forget about it. It's, uh -huh. it's, now it's not only on them, but it's in the car, it's mm -hmm. in the house, it's in your bed, it's mm -hmm. everywhere, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. I hear you. And they're, they're they like the, this. It's not even there for them. It's like the, they they could be covered in sand. And they'd be like, eh, nothing's about, nothing's going on here, right? Mm -hmm. Like you mm -hmm. know, they have no sense well, of it. Our kids feel things in different ways. My, you know, my son, especially when he's younger, had really no problem with winter and. You know, kids will roll around in the snow. It doesn't matter what the temperature mm. is. And as an adult, I'm like, I don't want to be out here at all. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> you know, there's something about as we get older, I think we just have less tolerance for some of that. And, and our, our our comfortable temperature range shrinks a bit, I think, as we as we get older. But I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of food, how about food trucks versus a Michelin star restaurant? What are you what are you going to oh. lean towards? This is tough. Um, right. I would say it depends on the type of food. Gotcha. So if I'm going like tacos, I'm going food truck. 100%. Right. Like there's no, there's no, there's no design that's going to be better. 
but if I'm gonna if I'm having a steak, I want like a Michelin star restaurant, like a steak or a nice piece of meat or something like that. I'm going Michelin star restaurant. But if it's like a taco or like you know something like that, like some kind of fried food or something like that, sure. like you just there's no way. Like you have to go with the food truck. <laughs> You know, it, it's it's funny you mentioned that because thanks to uh, my former colleague and friend, well, still friend, Paul, he <laughs> happened to ping me earlier this year to inform me that there actually is a place that has like Wagyu beef that is relatively, well, very close to my house. Back, my wife and I biked around it yesterday. A mm -hmm. And so that has unfortunately increased my my meat purchasing budget over the course of the summer, because once you've you've had some of those, it's really, really hard to then just go back to what you thought was a really good steak before but you're like well this yeah. is isn't as good as i think we had a couple weeks ago is it no it's yeah really not. so yeah you know, it's, it's good times good times yeah. but yeah all right well let me throw a couple more at you quick so game of thrones versus lord of the rings where do you come down on that dilemma i have to say lord of the rings because i i i guess i'll probably get castrated or whatever i don't really know i've never watched game of thrones so um yeah okay i so I guess my cop out there is that I didn't have HBO and <laughs> this was on it's fine. and uh, never watched it. Okay. So, um, yeah. And it's a commitment to be clear to catch up. It is. It's a yeah. lot of hours. And, I, and to be honest with you, I, I'm not a huge TV guy. Okay. I, I, I can live without TV um, for the most part. There sure. are very few shows that I that i've sat down and i really enjoy watching um but yeah yeah i've seen all the lord of the rings okay. um so that'll be my answer all right well if, if you haven't seen ted lasso yet it would be i will have failed if i didn't mention ted lasso ted lasso pretty much was the highlight of like 2020 for me because 100 agree. because with all the stuff that was going down in the world that year that show was the perfect. most uplifting show perfect yep that you could possibly watch yep. at the end so we started watching that you know my wife and i started watching that you know when it actually it was it was i think it had already been out for a little bit but best decision i ever made right <laughs> love that show and i haven't yet agree. i haven't started watching season two yet i haven't started because we had you know they came out while the olympics were on so yeah. we were watching you know and so we haven't started the second season yet so yeah, no, I, um, I can't. I, I could not agree more strongly. I was so taken with Ted Lasso. We watched season one three times, and it's yeah. still funny. There's so many lines that just make me crack out. Uh, you yeah. know, I love the bit about how do you take your tea. You know, I think that's one yeah. of my all time favorites. <laughs> you know, but just yeah. oh, so good. And if you have not seen Ted Lasso, yes, it is worth it. You know, hundred percent. But I tried convincing a couple of of my teammates about that, and they're like, "Well, I don't, I don't have, I don't have Apple TV," and it's like, get it watch it and then cancel like that's fine yeah. but you you're doing yourself a disservice if you haven't seen ted lasso my opinion. it's it's epic it's an yeah. epic, epic yeah. Show. Yeah. absolutely epic show yeah well let me ask you one more thing before we call it today since i know i've already gone long but i don't get a chance to hang out with you enough anymore and so so the olympics how what what sport did you watch during the olympics you're like okay i didn't think i'd sit down and watch this tonight i watched a fair amount of water polo okay um um I'm fascinated that those athletes have the ability to like swim right just the whole time right like you can't touch the bottom right you're just swimming the whole time and I'm like I can't even swim like a lap of a pool without being absolutely mm -hmm. exhausted mm -hmm. uh and they they just do it for the whole game and so we watched I watched a fair amount of war ball I was also kind of like fascinated with how they like they do something with their hand when they like throw the ball like it's almost like they fake them out and then i don't know. anyways it was just uh i was kind of into that this this year yeah for sure nice yeah oh, i cool. agree with you on that one i still don't understand how those athletes do that i don't know how the goalies don't drown you know? yeah i mean it's it's remarkable i watched a bit of the the open water swim which is basically like the swim marathon mm -hmm. and and i remember how exhausting it was to do like the Boy Scout swim test at Boy Scout camp. And I just can't even imagine these athletes being in the water for like two hours mm. swimming, 
you know, yeah. and it's just, it's just, it's crazy. But yeah, I, the, the other thing that amazes me about so many of those Olympic sports is you, you know, the level of time, effort, and energy it takes to get to that level. And then you also realize there's no monetary gain there. Like there, there's mm-hmm. no, I mean, there might be professional water polo. I don't know, but it probably doesn't pay very well. No. And, no. you know, open water swimming, same kind of thing. There's a lot of these sports where, you're clearly not getting rich doing it and you've spent 15, 20 years of your life yeah. to reach that point. You know, but... Yeah. That's crazy. Crazy amount of dedication to do right. that. But um, right. yeah, it's super impressive. The other thing I watched, which I was like, uh, kind of a little, I never watched speed walking before. Did you see any of that speed walking? Yes. And I saw that so... somebody got like a yellow card or something because they weren't speed walking correctly. Cause you can't run. Right. You one foot's to gotta be on the ground or something. Ground. Yep. Yep. And uh, they almost all look completely unnatural doing it. Yes. It doesn't look natural. No. Like it seems completely awkward. And so I was, I, I was kind of fascinated by how like maybe it was uh, actually not healthy for their bodies because no. it just doesn't seem right. Like it right. doesn't seem right. There was one runner that they had. And again, I didn't see all of them, but like there was one runner. I think it, I think it was the runner from, I shouldn't say runner, the walker from japan uh it was the only one that actually looked natural doing it everyone sure. else just looked so unnatural right. doing it right uh, and i was like oh this is this is really weird i couldn't stop watching it for just because i i just wanted to see how they how they did it but um yeah it, it does make you wonder how they come up with some of these sports uh, it does yeah i don't know how that how that got into the olympics but. some of them i think were dares or you know people <laughs> just really bored like like i watched some of the, the handball the same kind of thing and my whole yeah. thought pattern here was so we have a gymnasium we, we've got a basketball court we don't want to play basketball it's too small for us to play soccer but we got some soccer goals what if we threw it at each other yeah that sounds cool <laughs> so do you have to dribble not really because all we have is a volleyball and that doesn't quite dribble right okay well yeah. Can you walk? Well, yeah, you can do this. So do we have penalties? Yeah, kind of, but you can pretty much just tackle because we're all kind of a little rough here. And I mean, it just like the whole conglomerate of rules and sports that they mix the other format. I'm like, all right, cool. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. I agree. But, it's a little weird. But... Yeah, yeah, but it's fun. You know, so fun. we got another one of those in three years. Well, I guess yeah. we have a winner's Olympics in two. We're less than two. Yeah. So, so there I you think go. it's less than two. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, yeah. it's got actually it's got to be a year away, doesn't it? Because it'd be 2022. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. February, yeah, 2022. I think it was, well, yeah. Ryan, I could keep yakking at you, but I know you have a pile of email and Slack and other things that, that you should probably attend to. So I've done the, my best to to delay the inevitable for you, but I uh, appreciate catching up with you. And uh, you know, it's it's been a, a blast. I miss our, our content meetings. Um, so <laughs> it's nice to get to chat with you about something other than this abstract or that abstract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, I appreciate you having me on and asking me to do this. It's really fun uh, chatting about all different types of things. So um, yeah, anytime. Awesome. I'd well, love to thank, come back and talk. Thank you again, my my friend. I really appreciate. It. We have Dan Vega next week, the Dan Vega. Uh, so it should be fun to hang out with him. But until then, everybody have a great week, and uh, we'll see you next Monday. Cheers. Thanks.